We've played here since uh, 1901. We've played every single season, so uh, 122 seasons in a row. We're the oldest club in the league. We're one of the oldest members owned clubs in the world, and we've never been relegated. The club is an organisation that is owned by everybody, um, so there's no, uh, no individual making profit from the club. Although now, like I was a volunteer for over 10 years, and although I'm, I'm so lucky to be a paid, paid person in football, um, without volunteers the club doesn't work. So we probably have definitely in the hundreds, maybe two, three hundred volunteers. Sometimes people who will maybe do something once a year at a certain time, and there's other people who are here literally every single day. The club's board of directors, so the people who ultimately make the decisions, they are all volunteers and they, they cannot be paid under our rules. Somebody like Jimmy, he is here every single day and has been here every single day for, for decades and everybody knows who he is, but his list of things he does would be so big. Most people know because he runs our, our lotto each week, but when we have deliveries, when there's a problem, uh, this is, is Jimmy doing this and there's lots of other people like that as well. Great man, come. It's unusual, I suppose, that a fan-owned football club in, in the modern world, I suppose, people pay for something and they expect to get something back. So like, I think we live in a transactional society, so I pay you and I expect to get something. But with a fan-owned football club, the concept is that um, you pay uh, your money and then also you give more time or expertise or volunteer time. And the idea, I suppose, is that you, you at least keep the club as, as good as it is, but hopefully to make it better. That's the player of the year trophy there. Oh Jesus Christ. That was there when we bought it. A long time, 27 years ago. The player, the player gets a replica. We got it back in a bad condition after one player. So we decided not to let it out on again. We'd keep the original thing. Down there giving away a check for 10 grand. And this, and this, this one for 15 grand and hiding. So, get, getting old, it's time, time, time getting near retirement age. <laughs> Do you think you will ever retire from Bohemians? No. No, Jimmy never retired. No. Oh no, no. it's in his blood, he couldn't. He's still conditioned for that, that right Jimmy? I'm very good at making tea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for a cup of tea. My name is Jimmy. I've been coming to Dalyman Park since 1956. 90s, early 90s, I became a volunteer. You don't, you, you don't want to know how I got started when I was born. One week in 1950 and I was brought up to Dalyman Park as punishment. And I volunteer to clean up after international matches. And then I got up more involved in volunteering. When I stopped working, I had nothing else to do, so I came in to, as a volunteer for Bohemians. Oof, uh, well, first of all, I'd say I'd have to be careful describing him because he's a good man for dishing out abuse. But he's uh, not that he means any bad, but he's, he's, uh, he's well able to put you in your place. He's a character. He's good crack, and uh, being in his office says it all. I hope you get a bit of footage in there, because it's a little wonderland of things that people have got him to wind him up, and things he's got from old matches, and like you can see he loves the club, and it's really present in that office. Like Stuff like that you don't see too often these days. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a people's person. He is himself. And he, he, what you see is what you get at Jimmy. There's no gimmicks or anything like that, you know? He, he, he's a very kind and compassionate man. I would have been approached by the lads in the club to uh, paint a portrait of Jimmy behind his back. And you know, the idea is, you know, a lot some local legends get things painted of them when they've passed and they're not really celebrated, you know, in the moment or like while they're there to see it and put a smile on their face. So the lad said, We owe Jimmy a bit of a thank you and so they organised this and yeah, oh, it was yeah. a cool thing to do. Jimmy's a funny fella. I remember how you won Miss Mr. Universe in seventy nine, tell them about that one now. I know, don't we don't know that. Mr. Universe 1979. I was the second runner up you came. Third. You're too good looking. Third. You're too good looking and you got disqualified. <laughs> <laughs>
when I joined the board, this was right at the worst time. We had one board meeting uh, just in the room behind me and we genuinely believed that this was the last ever meeting of, of Bohemians. And this was in late 2011, early 2012. Um, we had a massive amount of debt. Um, we cut our playing budget by about 92%. So uh, we went from one year where um, the wage for all of the team was, was similar to just the coaching staff the year before. This is how, how big the change was. And it was, um, it was very difficult because I suppose everybody, when they heard Bohemians, they didn't think of football, they didn't think of the community here. They thought of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, when we were in the news, it wasn't for sport, it was, for, um, it was in the business pages to say that we were going out of business. Um, but what was amazing about that time is that uh, we didn't have any money, but we worked really hard um, without a penny. So on marketing, on our youth teams, and there were so many people uh, gave their time. When we came out of this period, it was almost like, because we, we couldn't win anything then, we just didn't have enough money. Not being relegated was a huge success in this time. Um, and we began to focus on off the pitch things a little bit, because we needed more people to come um, so we could get out of debt and the more we looked at things that were otherwise we wouldn't have done they, they helped the club so much and it changed I suppose how we how the club operates because we realized that we you could lose a football club that it, it seems like it's always going to be here but if people make bad decisions and if you know people don't work really hard that the club could be lost so uh, while it was a really hard time I think it was a really important thing that happened and it, um, since then our membership has increased by four times. So um, maybe it needed to happen to give everybody a shock. On the playing side, we have about 60 teams, um, boys and girls. We have an amputee team of people who are missing limbs. Um, we have a football for all team of um, children with Down syndrome. And then we have uh, academy teams, boys and girls, and senior men's and women's teams. Um, but then on the other side, outside of the football field, we have uh, club artists, uh, club poets, uh, climate officer, um, disability officer, community officer. So we try to use the club's platform um, to have as many people as possible linked to the club. And if that's somebody who can sing, if that's somebody who can draw or paint really well, or if that's somebody maybe who has an interest in the environment, we think that we can have everybody attached to the club um, and to try and represent the local area and to improve people's lives in this area um, and we find that an issue that somebody has in a local area is normally also an, an issue that everybody faces you know um, around the world especially with with things like climate and with migrants uh, with homelessness and um, with you know poverty so we use the club on the football side and the non-football side to reach as many people as we can i think it's really unique that you know bows invest in art and like it's it's a small investment for what it is really you know like there's there's so much culture that you can have in a club not anyone just lets you come along and, and paint what you want and uh, the lads here always gave me that opportunity you know Dan would have got on to me asked me was he interested I get, I get to try a different style if you're painting commercially you don't always get that opportunity but like the lads here are kind of trust in do what you want and do what you're passionate about and like each piece kind of turns out good as a result so um, yeah I'm pretty happy with the probably, 10 pieces I've done here over the 10 years. I think each one gets better, each one gets cleaner. So I'm a teacher also, and, and a few kids I teach, you know, are big into sport, but I teach art and, you know, true art, you can kind of get into a club, even though I'm not a good footballer. I still have a presence and do my bit in the club. And I try to, like, pass that on to kids as well, that, like, you know, an artist can make you look good or, like, help the team grow in different ways. So um, it's kind of cool being part of Bowes in that way, if, you know, Adam the Odd Mural, paying respect to some of the characters that are still here, other Irish legends that have like come through these grounds. I would have painted Bob Marley up the other end of the stadium. And uh, yeah, the reception I've always got is deadly and you get people, outlaws that have been at the gig, and they come along and they tell you stories about old women with shopping walking past as Bob Marley's being loaded in asking who's he and stuff like, I don't know, I've lot of men, a lot of like deadly characters like Jimmy and, uh, and like doing the paintings around here, it's been deadly. Well, Tom Garrett is my name, so I used to work in Dublin City Council years ago and I had to retire from the hip. But a couple of friends of mine were saying to me, because I'm a bit of a loner, asked me would I not join the club on my doorstep, and which I did, I got involved. 
then I, and I, I enjoy it very much. It gets you mixed with people, like, you know. And say, sport is a great thing. It's good for the self, you know, for the, for the mental well-being. Anyway, anywhere we go now, we live in the community, so in the community people become over and chat, chat me, and the first thing is football. And if, you, if you're trying to do something, no, you haven't got a hope. Once you start talking about football, that's the, that's the you know, highlight of the day, you know. Because football is, it is what it is around, it is a, it's an icon. What's hard to communicate is that we have a full stadium, and we have really strong merchandise sales, and we have a really good club. But even with all of this, um, there are lots of clubs who can take our players, um, that can spend more money than us, and and that's that's a difficult thing. It's a really difficult thing. So um, while you, I I really believe that right now we are re almost reaching our potential. You never reach your full potential, but in terms of our ability as a club to raise finance and behave in a you know in a in a proud way, in a way that's that's a good a good thing to do. I think we are doing all of this uh, quite well, but it still remains that if another club has a really wealthy owner, that they can make a big loss and and um, and maybe have a better team on the pitch. And this is a difficult one. So the only answer, if you want to change that, really, is to have a much bigger capacity in our stadium or to sell the club and not be a member's own club. And I I really think that no Bowes member wants to do that. So that's the biggest challenge right now is to try and explain that's a hard reality uh, for a fan-owned football club in a, in a capitalist uh, world. No, it's it's just been a really um, really hard thing. Like Mono, he, he he was he was one of these volunteers, like Jimmy, who really did everything here, and um, so young and a young family, and um, you know, it's just just awful. Like it was an accident. He was a, like a car accident, you know. And the guy, he has three kids, and you realise, and you realise with Jimmy now that like you know he did so much that you kind of hope you you wish you maybe said thanks more often for all the work that he'd done. Um, yeah, it's, sorry, it's pretty yeah. So, yeah. Well, we're still uh, lagging a little bit, you know, down all week, you know. And like, it's, it's something to comprehend that like a good man like that just passed away. And, uh, you know, you can't comprehend how it, it just would. You know, we didn't, just, no, no person deserves that child. And I, we're still, I say, we're still, you know, even at the match day you now against the uh, Pats, we were still, we're singing these praises, like, you know. And we still will because this is, his spirit is still here. Yeah, look, tomorrow, it, it's, this season has been difficult. Um, you know, we, 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 aren't, uh, we aren't in the table where we, we'd hope to be. Um, we've lost lots of good players who've went to the UK. Um, but on the derby, anything can happen. So I think we are... We are definitely the underdogs tomorrow, but also this, I think this suits us. There were some games for a short time where we were favourites and uh, I think the underdog will suit us tomorrow. And it's obviously, it's been an emotional time. I suppose we, our, our colleague and friend uh, passed away a couple of weeks ago. So that's been really hard for people. And I think a lot of people will want to, you know, win tomorrow for, for this person. And also our manager, uh, you know, we, we broke away from our long-term manager just two days ago. So I think, um, I think with our assistant manager is in charge and I think that he will want to win and the, f and the players will want to win. So it's impossible to give a prediction. Nobody likes to give a prediction. I, I hope that it's a close game and I hope that we win, but it will be hard. How long to stand? Completely gone. Come on, will it? I'd say it'd be days. Ah, uh, no, no, it's not simple to start. It's a slow process. I saw the yeah. photo, or video, just that, you know, tearing lumps out of it at the start, and I thought, geez, it'll be gone in minutes. Some of the machines are getting teething problems with them, they're breaking now and again, and that, you know. 
and they have to be replaced. Are you used to waiting for the new stadium anyway, aren't you? Sure. Dublin's last loads of good graffiti spots. That was a nice one because it had a roof over it. Um, but yeah, I missed that spot. All right, more than the pitch, <laughs> you know. This game is the top game in the league world. You're playing the cream of the cream. These are the games that bring the highlight to the area. You see the crowd as they are and how they, what gets them going. few years we've become much more popular but also uh, in our league like lots of leagues and um, the other our competitors they have uh, lots of them have private owners who have uh, a lot of money and who can spend and lose a lot of money um, when we can't because we need to be sustainable so uh, it's a challenging time but also exciting because we are, we've become so popular and there are challenges like I said with private money but I think that with volunteers and with people who care so much that the emotional connection is stronger than the maybe other clubs' financial connection. And right now, uh, two sides are being demolished and it will be rebuilt um, and it will change our capacity. At the moment it's 4,000 and it will change to, uh, we hope, 8,000. This will be really important to us because, again, like when I, we talk about a private football club, one area where we can bring in a lot more money is to have bigger attendances. We really need this to happen. Um, and this will enable us to uh, compete um, with, you know, with private clubs. It's a good thing, we need the stadium to improve, but also it will be pretty sad because uh, new stadiums are never the same as the old ones. Uh, so it's, it needs to happen and it's exciting, but it's also pretty sad. <laughs>